Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about rational functions. Okay, so we're going to look at how to find the domain of, of a rational function, how to find the vertical asymptotes, okay, um, how to find the horizontal asymptote, how to find the slant asymptote, and, and then we'll look at um, an example of how to graph a rational function. Okay. All right, so let's get started here. Okay. So first thing is to uh, define what a rational function is. So basically, a rational function is a function where the numerator and denominator are each polynomials. Okay. So let's write that up. Okay, so there's the there's the form that we're talking about. Okay. And each of these, okay, each of these is a polynomial. Okay. And because we're dividing by Q of X, we don't want Q of X to be zero. All right. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, we can also have, uh, well, remember that polynomial, a constant can be a polynomial. So technically you could have one over two, for example, okay? So y equals to one over two would be also considered a rational function because each of these is a polynomial, right? Okay. Not very interesting, but, uh, but it is under, it does fall under this category. All right, so let's look at the, the properties of, of one of the important uh, rational functions. That is one over X, okay? So let's talk about the properties of, of that particular function. Okay, so just to get a general idea of what this is doing, okay? So remember, this is, all right, so obviously this is a function of x, okay? Where x is your input, okay? And then the output is basically gonna be the reciprocal, okay? So for example, if we put in two, we're gonna get one half, okay? If we put in one half, then we're gonna get one over one half, which is two. So basically this is just taking the reciprocal of the input value, okay? All right, so the graph of it, the graph of this function looks like this. We have our independent axis, right? And we have our dependent axis here. Okay, so, okay. So basically, as x, Okay, so as X gets larger and larger, okay, you're gonna get one over a large number as X goes to infinity, okay? And so that means that the outputs here will start approach zero, okay? Likewise, okay, as X gets smaller and smaller, right, as X approaches zero, okay, and let's say they're approaching zero from this direction, okay? Um, the values are going to get larger and larger, okay? So that's something you can actually try in your calculator. 
you put in, if you put in one over, let's say, let's say one over a thousand, okay? Well, it's going to be a relatively small number, okay? So let's say, for example, X is one million. You put one over one million, well, that's going to be a very small number. Let's say you put, instead of one million, let's say you put one over 0. 0.00001. Well, that's going to be a very large number, okay? Right, so that's kind of an important thing to know, okay? Right, and so based on that, okay, our graph is going to look something like this. Okay, so this, these, right, so this function, right, is getting closer and closer to the x-axis as x goes to infinity. On the other hand, as x approaches zero, right, the output values, in other words, the y values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? All right, and in fact, I can, I can show you this here. I'm going to bring up my calculator here. I'm going to screen here. So I can see this. All right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just put in, let's say, um, let's say X is 10. So if you put in one over 10, then we get the value of 0.1, okay? We put in one over, let's say 100, then we're gonna get 0.01, okay? Put in one, one divided by 1,000, okay? We get 0 0.001. So again, this is illustrating the fact that as X increases as X goes to infinity, the overall values that you see here start to approach zero. Okay. And that's the and that's the basically what that's what you're seeing here. As X goes to infinity, the values right are getting smaller and smaller. Okay. They're approaching this X axis. Okay. But they're never going to they're never going to reach zero. Okay. All right, let's look at what happens on the other on the on the other end, meaning that as x approaches zero, okay. Okay. So this well, let's say x is 0 0.01. So we get 100, okay? Uh, let's say we have x is 0 0.001. We get 1000, okay? Let's do 0 0.00 Zero, 01, okay? And we get, well, yeah, we get 1,000 again, obviously. So one point, let's say, one divided by point, let's say, let's throw in one more zero there. And so we get 10,000, okay? All right, so you can obviously see that these values, right, the output values are getting larger and larger and larger, okay? As X approaches zero, okay? And in this case, we're letting X approach zero from the, the right side, okay? okay? So as X approaches zero from this side, okay? You can see that the values are getting larger and larger and larger, okay? All right, so what's going on on the other half of the plane here, okay? Well, the only difference is that now the X values are negative, okay? So we pretty much get uh, this, this graph. Okay, so again, as X goes to, in this case, negative infinity, okay, because now the X values are negative, okay, so they are getting closer and closer to zero, okay, and as X approaches zero from the left side, okay, from 
this side, okay? Right? Because x is negative now, okay? That means these are going to, right, minus infinity, okay? All right, and so this gives us what's called the reciprocal function, okay? can say the reciprocal, yeah, sometimes we say that this is yeah, the reciprocal function and, and this is the reciprocal graph, okay? All right, so let, let's just summarize uh, the, what, what I said earlier, okay? So I'll introduce you to some notation that uh, you will see, well, combined with some other things, uh, that you'll see in calculus, okay? So this just means as X approaches zero, okay, from the right side, so that, that's what that plus sign means, okay? So X is approaching zero from the, from the right side. So the output values, right, are going to go to infinity. Okay? And remember, infinity is more of just a um, concept, okay? It's not a defined number. So it just means it's getting, the numbers are getting larger and larger and larger. So the idea is that if you think of whatever number, whatever the largest number you can think of, I can, we can always add one to that. And then we can, right, and that kind of argument can go back and forth, okay? So that's kind of a way to think about infinity. All right, what about, uh, right, as X approaches zero from the left side? So as x approaches zero from the left side, right, then f of x is approaching negative infinity. Okay. All right. And as x approaches infinity, okay, as x gets larger and larger, right, then the function values approach zero. And as x approaches minus infinity, again, the function values approach zero, okay? All right. All right, so based on this information, okay, um, we, so we have, right, in this case, x, as x approaches zero from the right and left, okay, so it, okay, and as x approaches zero from the right, it, Function values go to infinity. As x approaches zero from the left, the function values go to negative infinity. So we call x equals zero a vertical asymptote, okay? Okay, so vertical asymptote, right, involves, right, a vertical line, right, so this is x equals zero going through the origin here, okay. The other part that is important, okay, is this part right here, okay, so as x goes to infinity, the function values go to zero, as x goes to negative infinity, the function values also go to zero. So, okay, so this right here, okay, we say that y equals zero, right, is the horizontal asymptote. And it's, for horizontal asymptotes, they're always y equals to some value, okay? So in this case, y equals zero is here, and this is x equals zero, okay? All right? Okay, so with vertical asymptotes, the function either goes to plus or minus infinity depending on, you know, which direction, okay, that x, depending on the, uh, the direction that x, um, is that x is approaching, whatever the value is, okay. Um, it doesn't always have to be zero here, okay, um, but for this function it is, okay. Um, and then for horizontal, as for the horizontal asymptote, it's always going to be y equals to some number, okay? So, all right. 
Okay, so those, so basically, um, those are the important properties of the reciprocal function, okay? Um, so based on what you see here, okay, um, you can see that the domain, okay, going back to this idea, so the domain is going to be what? It's going to basically be all values of x except zero. Okay, so it's going to go from minus, so, so the function is defined on from minus, going from minus infinity to zero, okay, and then from zero to infinity, okay, so notice that there are parentheses around zero here, okay, and then the range, the range is going to be from minus infinity, okay, we start from the bottom, right, and then zero is not included there. Remember that there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, okay? So in other words, there's no x value that you can, that we can think of, right? There's no x value that when we put in here will give us zero, okay? okay? And so it's gonna go from minus infinity to zero, then from zero to infinity, okay? All right. And just one other important thing here. Okay? So this is really describing the local behavior around x equals zero. And over here, um, this is describing the end behavior. Okay, much like what we saw with um, polynomials, right? So with with the based on the and again, assuming the polynomial is written in descending order, so based on the leading term, we can tell whether the function is going to um, infinity or negative infinity as x goes to whatever plus or minus infinity. Okay. So these, right, so this is basically, so the horizontal, sorry, the vertical asymptote is just kind of looking at the local behavior around whatever, you know, what, wherever that vertical asymptote is, okay, in this case around zero. And then for the horizontal, right, so for the, for the horizontal asymptote, okay, uh, we're looking at the end behavior, okay, of the, of this function. Meaning what's happening as X goes to infinity, right? Oh, okay. And what's happening to the function as X approaches uh, minus infinity. All right. All right, so, all right, so how do we, so, again, so how do we, uh, how do we find the domain of a rational function? Well, the, it's a pretty straightforward process, okay? You basically just take, uh, you, you take the, um, you look at the denominator, set it equal to zero, you solve for those values, and then you want to exclude those from the, from the, from the whole set, from the set of all real numbers, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna just write that up here, and then we'll go through an example. So, you, so basically, the idea is that you want you want to figure out okay where we want to figure out where these are which x values will make this zero because right we want to figure out okay if 
we find those x values that make zero, then we want to exclude them because we don't want this output to be zero here. Okay. Right. So we set the so to find those, okay, we set the denominator equal to zero, uh, then exclude exclude those values. From the set of real numbers. All right, let's go over, uh, let's, let's do an example here. So let's say we want to find the domain. Of say f of x equals to x over x squared plus five x minus thirty six. Okay, so, right, so we want to set this equal to zero. Right, and then, right, and then figure, okay, let's, and then solve it, right? Right, so this turns out to be factorable. So two numbers of, so we need to find two numbers of, or another thing, sorry, I should say uh, two factors of negative 36 that add to five. And that's going to be negative, uh, sorry, positive nine and uh, positive four, right? Okay. So negative, negative nine, sorry, positive nine and negative four. Okay. So so nine times negative four, that gives us negative 36. At the same time, when we take the sum of nine and negative four, that's going to give us five. Okay, so we set each factor equal to zero. And we get negative nine and four. Now, this is not the this is not the domain. Okay, these are remember these are the values that make this denominator zero. So we don't want these values in. We don't want these values to be in the domain. So we have to exclude them. Okay, we have to exclude them from the set of real numbers. So the domain is going to basically be all real numbers, okay, except these. Okay, and in fact we can. Can write that and we can basically um, look at this on the number line. So there's negative nine, there's four, and we want to exclude those from the number line. All right, okay, so our domain, okay, we can write this, can write this in terms of interval, um, in terms of interval notation. Okay, so we're going from minus infinity, right, we have, we have this part, so, okay, minus infinity to negative nine, okay, and then from negative nine to four, Just write it down here. Okay, so we're going from minus nine to four and then from four to infinity. And basically that is our domain. Okay. 
go from minus infinity to negative nine, negative nine to four, and then from four to infinity, okay? And remember, so we use parentheses, right? Okay, we want parentheses around these values, okay, around negative nine and four, because uh, we, don't, we don't want to include those. Okay? All right. Okay, so next thing is, how do we find the vertical asymptotes? Okay. Okay, so let's first define the uh, vertical asymptote. Okay, so remember a vertical asymptote is basically it's going to be x equals to some constant. So vertical line, right? let's say x equals to a, or a is some constant, some value such that So as x approaches a from the left, okay, then the function value will either go to positive or negative infinity, okay, depending on just depending on what the function is. Okay. So it's either going to do it's e so it's either going to go to positive like up, or it's going to or the function will go down, okay. And x. Okay. Um, looking at the other direction, right? As x approaches a from the right, then again, okay, f of x could go to, right, it's either going to go to positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay. All right. And I should put and here. Okay. Um, and or, or, so it just depends. So, uh, but for our case, yeah, for our rational functions, this, it'll be and here. There are some functions that, um, some other kind of functions, for example, um, like the uh, like the log function, um, where that log function is only defined on a certain domain. So we only look at what's happening as x approaches. So there's a there's a there's a vertical asymptote. So we only look at what's happening as x approaches that vertical asymptote from the uh, from the right side. Okay, but for but for these kind of functions, for rational functions, then um, it's so we have we're going to have um, either x right. So x will approach a from the left, and x um, it's going to approach a from the from the right side. Okay, all right, and then depending on the function, right? It that function right? It may go down to negative infinity. It may go up to infinity. Okay. All right, so um, so how do we find it? Okay, so very very important. So what you have to do right is you got to make sure you have to simplify the function first. Okay, then then kind of like what we did here. Okay, you're going to set the denominator equal to zero. 
Okay. And then that's and then that's going to the solution you get is going to turn that's going to be your vertical asymptote. Okay. So let's go over an example of this. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just but I'll just write this first. All right, so to find the vertical asymptotes, and I'm gonna put an S here because sometimes rational functions have more than one. Okay. All right. That the denominator equal to zero, then then solve. So very very important. You got to simplify it. Okay. This is right. Vertical lines course right. So vertical asymptote corresponds to vertical lines. Okay. All right. So we must simplify it first. Okay. All right. Let's look at an example of this. And again, what I mean by simplify? Well, right. It means we're going to factor the numerator and denominator, and then see, and then cancel out the um, cancel out the common factor. Okay. And so we want to find the vertical asymptotes for this function. Then we get uh, x over x squared minus 9. Okay, so this is already, um, it's already simplified, meaning that there's no, right, it's, so we can factor the bottom, right, so we end up getting x minus 3, so the bottom part here will be x minus 3 times x plus 3, and the top part, we get x here. Okay, so there's no common factor, so it's already simplified, okay? So now we just set, right? So basically we just set this denominator equal to zero. So equal to zero, that implies this. All right, so there's our factors and then we set each factor equal to zero. And notice that when you solve it, you get, right, we get the vertical lines here, right? Okay, so those are, right, so these are our vertical asymptotes. And I can show you on the graph here. Uh, 
y equals to, what was it? Um, x over x squared minus nine. Color. And normally when we when we plot these, okay, um, even though the vertical, even though they are um, vertical lines, we usually indicate these, sometimes we indicate these with a hyphenated line. Just for better visual effects. There they are, and you can see, okay, you can see as x approaches three from the right side, the function values, right? These function values get bigger and bigger. As x approaches three from the left side, the function values go to negative infinity. As x approaches over here, as x approaches negative three from the right, the function values get larger and larger. As x approaches negative three from the left, the function values uh, go to negative infinity. So one, so something to keep in mind is that the function will never cross its, um, it will never cross its vertical asymptote. Okay. So, okay. so functions, right? So functions don't cross the vertical. They never cross. They never touch the vertical asymptote. Okay. Okay, so we found our vertical asymptotes. Uh, let's look at another example. Okay, so we want to find the vertical asymptotes, okay? Right? And with this example, I'm going to also introduce the idea of what's called holes, okay? Okay, so our function is this. We have x squared plus 5x plus 4, all divided by x squared minus 1. OK, so first thing to do is, uh, is to simplify it, OK? All right. OK, so we look at the top part, OK? We have four here, so two factors of four that will give us five. Uh, that's going to be four and one. Okay. Four times one gives us four. At the same time, when we take the sum and when we take the sum of four and one, in other words, when we add those, we get five here. Okay. On the bottom, okay, uh, we have difference of two squares. So this is going to be x minus one times x plus one. Okay, and all right, you notice that right here. Okay, we have x plus one, and here we have x plus one. So we can cancel those out, okay? And that's going to leave us with what's a, basically a simplified form of this one. So I'm going to call that, I'm going to call this R of X for reduced form. Okay. 
So this is so this illustrates why it's important to um, to simplify the function because if if we didn't simplify it, okay, then you would think that okay, you would say all right, you, you set this equal to zero, and then you would end up getting right x minus one times x plus one equals zero, and we get x equals to one and x equals to negative one. So in that, so if you didn't simplify this and you set this equal to zero, you're going to think that um, this function has two vertical asymptotes. But the truth is, it only has one. Okay, so that's why it's very, very, very important uh, to simplify first. Okay, if if possible. All right. All right. So let's go back over here. Okay. So we set. So obviously then. Setting this denominator equal to zero, we get x minus one equals zero, and then we get um, x equals to one. Okay, so that is our okay, uh, that is our vertical asymptote here. Okay. All right, all right. So what about uh, what about the whole? Okay, and we're going to. So some functions have more than one holes. In this case, there's only one hole, okay? But the way you get the hole is that you look at the factor that was canceled out, okay? So you go back to, you look at this part right here, okay? Right? And you set that factor, okay, equal to zero. So we're going to get x equals to negative one. Okay. In fact, if you plug, right, so if you substitute negative one into here, okay, right, you're going to end up getting uh, one minus five, which is negative four, right, and negative four plus four is zero. And if you plug negative one to here, you're going to get zero. Okay. So f of negative one is. Zero, zero. So in math, we call this an, an um, indeterminate value, and you'll talk about more. You'll you'll discuss um, you'll discuss these more when you get into uh, calculus one. Okay. But something to keep in mind here. Okay. So when you right. So when you plug negative one into here, you get zero, zero. So this is right. So this is not okay. So this is not one, by the way. Okay. This is not the same thing as one. Okay. This is when we say ind it's indeterminate, so it's it's not defined. Okay. Okay. So that means we have a hole, right? So this value is not in the domain. Okay. So then the question is, okay, where, okay, where does this, okay, what would be the output value? What would be the output value then? Okay. How do you find the like the y value? Okay. So what you do is you plug that value back into this one, okay? okay. So you use this function, the reduced one. Okay, and so when we plug negative one into here, then we're going to get minus one plus four, and then we get negative one minus one, okay? That is going to give us negative, so we get basically three over negative two, which is the same thing as minus three halves, okay? So what this is saying is that, okay, if we are to plot this function, okay, it's gonna look like this, okay? Remember, this is the reduced form. Okay, so it's going to look like it's going to look like this, except there's going to be a hole in it, and that hole is basically located at okay, okay, it's, it's basically going to be um, at negative one comma negative three halves. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to graph this right, and then on, on Desmos it doesn't. It, it doesn't show up, so that's uh, that's why it's important to, to understand uh, to understand these concepts these concepts. Okay, um, so I'm going to plot this one. Okay, 
Okay, and I'll plot this one. Okay, and then um, I'm going to plot the whole. Okay. All right. So y equals to, let's see, x squared plus 5x plus 4 divided by x squared minus 1. Okay, and then I'm going to, we have the other one, the reduced form, which is x plus 4 over x minus 1. So you can see, I'm going to change this. So I'm going to, so when I turn this one off, okay, right, you can see it's the same, right? So I turn there's, right, so there's the original, right? I turn this one off, and there's the reduced one. So in Desmos, it doesn't, um, it doesn't tell you, right? It doesn't, basically, it doesn't um, plot the holes for you. So usually when we plot these, we have to put a circle. We have to indicate a circle of where the hole is. So we can plot the points, right? So mathematically, we know that the hole is going to be a negative one, negative three. And then I'm going to change this to usually use a circle. And so there it is. So sometimes I call this, sometimes I refer to this as a ghost point, okay? All right, so, all right, um, yeah, so that's how you, that's how you find these, okay? Again, what you do is you make sure, okay, so you have to reduce the, or simplify the top and bottom, um, cancel out the common terms, right, the common factors, right? And then, and then once you once you do that, you set the denominator equal to zero. That will give you your vertical asymptote. For the whole, it's it comes from the term that you cancel that you canceled out. So we factor out x plus one. So we set that equal to zero. And then we plug that by we plug that x value back into the reduced function, back into this one. Okay. You don't want to plug it back into here because it's going to give you zero over zero, okay, which is indeterminate, uh, undefined. Okay. All right. All right. So let's look at how to solve for the horizontal asymptote. And by the way, for rational functions, okay, um, rational functions only have, uh, they can never have more than one, okay, rational function. Okay. There are some other kind of functions, okay, that are not rational that could have more than one, okay, but for rational functions, they can only have one, or they can't have, I should say, they can't have more than one. Okay. All right, so we're gonna let our function be a rational function, be a rational function, right? We have
Okay. So we have, we're going to assume that the top is written in descending order. Okay. So it doesn't matter what's going on here. Um, this is going to basically depend on what the leading coefficients are. Okay. So we have the general form of a polynomial on the top, and then we have the general form on the bottom. So this just means it's going to continue, right? So this is just the general form of a, of a polynomial, right? If we have our coefficients, right? And then um, same thing here. You know, on the bottom, we have the general form of a polynomial, okay? So looking for the horizontal asymptotes will depend on, basically it depends on the leading coefficients and along with the um, degrees, okay, of each polynomial, okay? So... All right, so if, if the degree on the bottom is bigger than top, right, meaning that, um, the de right, so the degree here is bigger than this one, then the horizontal asymptote is basically going to be zero. I'll just abbreviate that, okay? Okay, so it's just going to be zero. Okay, so the 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 general idea is this. So because the degree on the bottom is bigger than the top, so these terms are increasing at a much at a more uh, at a faster or increasing at a much faster rate relative relatively um, to the um, to the values in the numerator. And so that's going to drive everything. Um, basically, everything's going to get closer and closer to zero. Okay, um, you'll start to if you take when you take calculus, you'll start to understand um, why that's happening. Okay. If the degrees are the same, okay, then the horizontal asymptote is basically, right, it's going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. Right? So you take this value, divide by this value, simplify it, and that's going to be the horizontal asymptote. If M is smaller than N, so in other words, if the degree on, on the bottom is less than the degree at the top, uh, then there are no uh, there are no horizontal asymptotes. And in that case, we end up getting. So what we end up getting is what's called a, a, a slant or oblique asymptote. So basically, slant and oblique asymptotes are, um, and there's a slight difference here. Even though in some pre-calculus books they kind of, uh, they kind of throw in the same term, but the slant asymptote is usually um, it's degree one. Okay. Meaning that it's not going to be it's not going to be a horizontal line or a vertical line. It's going to be on a on a certain slant, right? On a, okay, it it could be like um, it it could be on a, a positive slant or a negative slant. Um, oblique asymptotes um, those are generally those are generally degree two or higher.
right? So these could be like um, parabolas, um, cubics, quartics, quintics, and so on, okay? Okay, so let's go to an example of this. Okay, let's look at the uh, for the first one. Okay, okay so notice that the uh, the degree on the top is equal to the degree at the bottom. We have degree three here, okay, and degree three here. So that tells us uh, that the horizontal asymptote is going to be six over two, which is three. So let me show you that on the graph here. And again, it's 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 a horizontal line, but sometimes on the graph we we hyphenate it, uh, we we write it in a hyphenated form. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Okay, so again, so because it's a horizontal asymptote, so what's happening is x um, is approaching infinity. The the y values right here out, in other words, your output values are getting closer and closer to three. As x is going to negative infinity, okay, the y values are getting closer and closer to positive three. Okay. 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 Let's look at another example here. Okay, let's say this time our function is okay, um, let's say it's x uh let's say x squared plus eight x squared or sorry a x to the power four divided by five, or so plus five, so x squared plus eight x to the power of four, divided by x squared plus three, 
plus 2x to the power 4. Okay, okay so again, be really careful, all right? The, in order to use this rule, we're assuming that the polynomials are written in descending order for, for the numerator and the denominator, okay? So let's, all right, so if you look at this, you can clearly see that they're not in descending order. So let's go ahead and put them in descending order now. So it's always a good habit to, to check that, okay? So, right? Yeah, so the horizontal asymptote is not gonna be one, right? You're not taking, it's not the ratio of, it's, it's the ratio of the leading coefficients, okay? Leading coefficients correspond to the terms with the highest exponent, okay? So these are not, right? These are not the, these, these don't have the highest exponent. So now, now that we have this form, okay, every, so this is in descending order, this is in descending order, okay? So then, right, we can see that now the horizontal asymptote is going to be four here, okay? okay so basically eight over two. This is two, four, okay? So very important, okay, you can't always, you always have to be careful of details. Right, especially working in math. Okay. All right, uh, let's do another example. Okay, let's say we have okay, let's say we have four x plus x squared minus one, and okay, all divided by okay, uh, three plus. Three plus uh, nine x squared minus ten x to the power three. So this is another one where you, where you have to be really careful. Okay. So it's not in right. So the answer right is right. So you're not going to take um, right here's. So basically, it's not uh, it's not in the same order, right? For the numerator and denominator. So let's go ahead and write in the in the right way. So that it's consistent with this definition. Okay. So the numerator numerator we get x squared plus four x minus one. For the denominator denominator we're going to get minus ten x to the power three plus nine x squared plus three. Okay, now you can right, you can see okay, um, that the degree in the bottom is bigger than the degree in the top. Although you could also see it there, but it's always just a you know it's just a good habit to write them in descending order just to make sure everything's consistent. Okay. So based on that, okay, based on what we see here, okay, uh, we can tell that there's uh, that the horizontal asymptote is going to be zero because the degree in the bottom. Is is larger than the degree on the top, okay? So it's going to be zero, okay? All right. So let me show you what that looks like. Oh, 
fun divided by three plus nine x squared minus ten x cubed. And there it is. Okay, so we have okay. This also illustrates something else important. Um that the graph may, okay. Um, like what you see here, the graph may cross, it's it's okay if it crosses the horizontal asymptote. Um, but it's not going to, it's when it does that, it's going to be, um, if it does cross the horizontal asymptote, it's going to be relatively close to the origin, okay? In other words, as your as X is going to, you know, positive infinity, um, you're not going to see it cross the horizontal asymptote, right? Same thing, if X is going to negative infinity, it's not going to cross the, um, the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so if it does cross, it's usually a, it's relatively close to around zero. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. So that is a so that is something to keep in mind that a graph may cross its horizontal asymptote, but it will never uh, for right. Uh, it will never cross the vertical asymptote. Okay. Okay, so so again, you know, it's important to make sure that when you're reading, when you're trying to you apply this rule, make sure that the polynomials are, are um, make sure that you, you know, make sure they're written in descending order. Okay, so this one, okay, we know that this is right, top is degree four, degree four. That's right, and then we take the ratio. And then the same thing over here. We have degree two here, degree three on the bottom. So the degree on the bottom is bigger than the degree on the top. So that means we have y equals zero. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about this idea with slant asymptotes. Okay. So slant asymptotes, um, basically, they uh, they come from if mainly if the um, if the degree at the top is bigger than the bottom. Okay, uh, same thing with oblique asymptotes. Okay, so let's say in this example, okay, to illustrate how to find these, um, let's say we have we want to find the slant asymptote. For this function. Okay, so notice the degree on the on the top, right? Now the the, the uh, degree in the numerator is bigger than the degree in the denominator. Degree two, degree one. So this is going to end up with a uh, definitely end up with a slant asymptote. Okay. Um, all right. So kind of a, a side note here. Okay. Um, if we all right, so just a, a little bit of side note before we look at this. Um, if we take, if we look at, uh, if we take the ratio. We take the ratio of these leading terms here, okay? We're gonna have, okay, so basically we get, um, we're gonna have uh, 3x squared over x, which basically gives us 3x, okay? So this, right, so this kind of tells us, right, remember, so this kind of, so this kind of tells us what the, uh, and it kind of gives us an idea of what the end behavior is doing. So it's doing something like this, okay? All right. So we expect when we find the slant asymptote, we expect it to be a degree one, 
uh, asymptote. And that's what we see here. This is the degree one polynomial, okay? So this is not the slant asymptote, but this kind of gives an idea, okay? Just a general idea of what the function will look like as X goes to plus or minus infinity, okay? All right, so it's just an approximation, okay? All right. Okay, so. So how do we find this, okay? So what we need to, so what we do is we use, we can either use long division or some, or, or um, synthetic division. And since we're dividing by something linear here, okay, let's just go ahead and use uh, synthetic division. Okay, so basically with synthetic division, right? Remember that we're working with just the coefficients. So we have three minus two and then one. And then we have X minus one. So we're gonna put uh, one out here, okay? And remember that's, that's determined by, we take, we take this and set it equal to zero then we get x equals to one, okay? All right, so, all right, so we bring this down, okay? So we get three times one, we put that there, okay? Uh, take the sum of these, negative two plus three is one, one times one is one, and then we add those up, take the, or take the sum of those, okay? And remember, this is our right? this is our remainder, right? This is our constant term. And this is our coefficient for the x term. Okay, so remember what this means, okay? So we're taking, okay? Uh, so, so basically we're taking this divided by this, okay? So that means we have three X squared minus two X plus one, all divided by X minus one. So this is going to be equal to, okay? We have three uh, X plus one, okay, plus, the remainder over x minus one. Remember this kind of division algorithm, right? This kind of uh, idea is a way to rewrite this, okay? And so it turns out, um, it turns out that our slant asymptote is, is this. Right, so what's so what's going on here is that, um, and you'll and again you'll understand more of this when you get into calculus. Um, there's something called the limit. In other words, we want to see what's happening to the function as x approaches infinity. Okay, right for this case. Okay, so what's happening here? Okay, because this is right asset. So this is an asymptote. So we're interested in what's happening. Um, in this case, as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So what's happening here is that, yes, we have this function, okay? And then if we let x go to infinity, this part right here, okay, is going to go to zero because x and x is going to infinity here, right? And so you have a constant divided by something getting larger and larger and larger. And so this term, right, basically approaches zero. It doesn't... It doesn't, um, it never, it never reaches zero, 
but it's getting smaller and smaller. So this is what we call residual term. Okay. All right. And so what happens is that this becomes the dominating function. Okay. Okay. So this, all right. So this becomes our slight asymptote. And all right. So we write it this way. So y equals to 3x plus 1, okay? All right. So in the beginning, right, um, the beginning we were, right, so that's kind of what we said here, okay? We look at the ratio of those, okay? And then um, we said that this function is going to behave something like 3x, well, if you look at this, it kind of, we have a 3x there, okay? okay. Um, all right, so that's, so again, this is just an idea, right? It's just more of a, a, a quick, like kind of a quick way to see what the function is going to do as x goes to plus or minus infinity, okay? And so, if we, so to actually find this slant asymptote, okay, we have to go through this process. We can also use long division, by the way, um, to get the same result. Okay. All right, let's plot this. So we have y equals to 3x squared minus 2x plus 1 divided by x minus 1. Okay, and I'm going to plot the slant asymptote, which was 3x plus 1. Color here. All right. And there you go. There you can see, right? Um, as X gets larger and larger, you can see that this graph, it starts to, the Y values start to look like 3X plus 1. Okay. And then as X goes to negative infinity, you can see again, the y values get closer and closer to 3x plus 1. But it will never, again, it won't. So just like with, um, uh, just, you know, like with vertical asymptotes, they're not going to, it's not ever going to cross, okay? And it's not going, it's, so it's not going to touch the asymptote nor, nor cross. Okay. So actually, this kind of idea um, is used um, some cases it's used in computer science, okay? Because um, if you're, let's say you're calculating this, okay? Um, you're doing some kind of project that involves this. Well, there's, you have different operations here, okay? Each operation can, takes takes a little bit of time, right? I mean, well, it's quick, but it adds up if you're, especially if you're working with millions of lines of code. Um, and let's say you're working with four loops or Okay, or doing certain iterations. So if you look at this function here, okay, um, you have x squared, so that counts as one, okay, three times x squared, that counts as two. We have another multiplication, that's three, and then we have uh, subtraction and adding, so that's five, a total of five, uh, that's five operation counts, okay, Let's see, so one, two, or five, and then the bottom we have one, right? Six, and then division, so seven. So this is there's seven operation counts in here, and compare that to this one. There's only two. You have plus, and you have multiplication. So when you're working with very large, if you're working with large sets of data, um, that could mean a difference and and um, that, that could mean a lot of difference in terms of computational time okay so why not like you know if you're working with large data okay data values just use this one this is this is fairly this is a fairly good approximation for 
right? The larger, so the larger the X, the better the approximation. So you, so, you know, so you, so using this would save considerable, would save a consider, considerable amount of time compared to using this, right? Compared to this one, okay? So this is actually, um, this is actually discussed in a course called asymptotic analysis, um, which um, many um, computer science um, majors take. Okay? And it's really to, uh, to make the, just kind of learn how to um, efficiently, um, to, uh, to speed up code. Okay? So a very interesting area actually. All right. All right, so the next thing to talk about is to is to put all this together. Okay. Right? So we can obtain, we got that we can obtain some information, right? We can get some information about the rational function and then use that to, to help us graph it. All right, so let's say we want to graph this rational function. All right, let's say we have 3x squared minus 5x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. Okay, so to help us graph this, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to find the following, okay? So we're going to find the x and y intercepts. We're going to find any any of the asymptotes And our and holes. Yep. Okay. Let's go through this. Okay. So first, okay, let's first figure out the uh, the y-intercept, right? So to find the y-intercept, remember, so that's where the, uh, that's where the graph is going to cross the, the y-axis. So we want to figure out, okay, what is the y-value corresponding to uh, x being zero? So we just need to evaluate the function at zero. Okay. 
Okay, so when you plug in zero here, you're going to end up getting negative two over minus four. So that's going to reduce to two or four, which reduces to one half. Okay, so the y-intercept is zero comma one half. So just basically just let x be zero and then solve for the output. Okay, so that's where the graph is. That's where this the graph of this function is going to cross the the uh, y-axis. Okay. All right. So the next thing is to uh, is to look for the x-intercept. Okay. All right. So. All right. Um. Okay, so to do that, okay, we are going to, um, it's best to, so just like finding the um, horizontal asymptote, it's best to simplify the function first, okay? And then we can, uh, and then, well, actually you could, I mean, yeah, you could find it and using this form, but Sometimes it's a little bit, um, it, when we reduce this, sometimes it's a lot easier to work. In fact, we could have simplified this first and then found the y-intercept. Um, so let's, but in any case, let's go ahead and simplify this, okay? Okay, in fact, we should, yeah, it's, it's best to do that in the beginning, but uh, let's, so let's do that. Okay, so, all right, so this is going to, right? So looking at the top, okay, uh, we're going to get, okay, um, we need to, well, let's do the bottom first. Bottom is difference of two squares. So that's going to be x minus two times x plus two. Okay. And for the top part, okay, um, just in case, if you, so in case you, you you'll get if you need a review on that, um, let's do that over here. Let's say we want to factor this polynomial. Okay. In fact, I'll probably do it over here. Uh, that's, yeah, that's okay. Do it here. Okay. So if we want to factor something like this, okay. So notice that there's a three in front of x squared now. It's not just simply one, okay. So the process to factor this uh, is a little, it's, it's basically, there's a, there's a technique to do this, okay? So what we do is we take three times negative two. So we multiply those, okay? And again, assuming that this is a descending order, okay? So this is gonna give us negative six, okay? Right? Okay, and so we're gonna, right, look for, factors of negative six that add up to negative five, okay? So that's going to be, uh, that's gonna give us basically what? That's gonna give us, if we try, let's say negative two and three, well, that gives us, that certainly gives us negative six, but it's, but when we, when we add those, we get one, all right? So we need, um, Right, uh, so we need something else here, okay? So that's not gonna work, okay? Uh, what we need is this, okay? So because we have mi minus five there, uh, we're gonna use basically, let's see, negative six and one, okay? So minus six times one will give us negative six. At the same time, when we add those, we're gonna get right minus six plus one is negative five. Okay, so what do we do with these? Okay, well we're gonna use those to rewrite the middle coefficient. So we're gonna get so we're gonna get three x squared minus six plus x minus two. Okay, and it doesn't matter. You could put x here and minus six x here. It doesn't matter the order. It's going to work out the same. But the point is that we've got right, we're writing this middle coefficient. Right? And so we use these values to help us with that. 
uh, to help us determine those values. Okay. All right. So then we have right. So we have three x squared minus six x plus x minus two. Okay. So we have four terms. So that means we're going to use factor by grouping. Okay. Something we uh, discussed before. Okay. So we're going to factor out a three and as well as an X, factor out as much as you can. Okay. And, oh, this is minus two, sorry. Okay, so we get, we factor out three X, so that leaves us with an X here. That's gonna leave us with minus two, right? Minus two times three X is negative six X. And here we have X minus two, okay. All right. And so then we notice that we get x minus two as a, right? We see that those are common factors now of both of these. So we can go ahead and factor out the x minus two. That's gonna leave us with a three x. And then because we have x minus two here, so x minus two, times one, right, gives us x minus two. So we put a one in it, we put a one in its place. And remember that uh, we can look at this, right? Think of, or just think of, uh, think about that, um, there's a one here, okay? So there's our factorization. We have x minus two times three x plus one. Okay. okay, and if you notice, uh, we do have a common factor here, okay? All right. So that's, so this cancels out. It's gonna leave us with three X plus one over X plus two. Okay. So the X minus two cancels out. All right, and notice when you plug in zero, we still, right, if you let X be zero, we still get one half. So you could either do this in the beginning or end, or, or, or beginning or, um, or after, okay, it doesn't matter. But I guess it's, you know, it's a good habit just to do it in the beginning. Um, it makes everything else a lot easier, okay? Especially when it comes to um, locating your holes, right? All right, so we have this, and so now we need the x-intercept, okay? So to find x-intercept, remember the idea is that you, so the x-intercept is where the function crosses the, the x-axis, okay? Um, so we want to figure out, okay, what is, okay, what value of x will make the y zero, okay? So we set this, we set the function equal to zero, okay? So there's our reduced function. Okay. Right, we set this equal to zero. Okay. And, and in fact, it's good that we it, it's you like I said, it's we should simplify it because when so if we were to set this on top, right? If we were, so if we set this equal to zero, um, then we may get, you know, you have X minus two here, top and bottom. So you may forget to cancel that out. And then if you set both of these equal to zero, you may, that may give you some wrong information. So it's just a good habit to simplify in the beginning anyway. Okay. So we end up with this. Okay. So solving this, we can just, this is the same thing as solving this. Okay, so just uh, multiply both sides by x plus two, right? Okay, so basically just setting the numerator equal to zero and then solve for x. Okay, um, and we're gonna end up getting, so we have three x plus, like three x equals to negative one. So that means x is going to be equal to negative one third. So that is our x intercept. So negative one third comma zero. So again, you 
you know, when you do this, you can look for the x-intercept in the beginning here, but you got to be careful here, okay? Um, you have to, you know, because it, you know, because you set the numerator equal to, if you set the numerator equal to zero, you're going to think that x equals two is an x-intercept, but it's not, okay? Um, so just, so, you know, so just simplify the function and then go from there. It, it, you know, it will save you, uh, it will save you the, um, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll be better that way, okay? All right, so I'm gonna erase this, okay? So, so far, okay, we have the y-intercept and we have the x-intercept. There's our y-intercept and there's our x-intercept. Okay, the next thing is uh, we want to uh, go ahead and find, let's go ahead and find the um, horizontal asymptote. Okay. And so looking at a reduced function, okay? So I'm gonna say this is R of X. Okay, so the degree here is, right, is the same as the degree in the bottom. Right, degree one, degree one. So therefore, our horizontal asymptote, okay, going to be y equals to three over one. So you just take the right. There's a so there's a one here. You take the ratio of these values okay, of the leading coefficients. Okay. All right. Uh, let's look at the vertical asymptotes. Okay, so vertical asymptote, right? So definitely we look at the simplified form of the original function as we're going to set that denominator. We're going to set the denominator equal to zero. You're going to get uh, x plus two equal to zero, and that's going to give us negative two. Okay. We found our, our vertical asymptote. And we have our horizontal asymptote here. Okay. All right. So then the next thing is the hole. Okay. All right. So you look here, you look at the term that, that was canceled out. Okay. Set that equal to zero, and that's going to give you the location of that of that hole. Or what I like to call, what I like, what I like to say is the um, the ghost point. Okay, so x equals to two. Okay, and so then we want to figure out. Okay, what is we want to figure out what is the coordinate? So we plug two back into here. Okay, so we use this one. So that gives us seven fourths. So that means the hole, right? Coordinate for that hole is going to be two comma seven fourths. Okay. All right. So we have enough information, right? So when you plot this, you plot your x and y intercepts. Um, you plot your any of your horizontal, vertical, oblique. Oh, by the way, we don't have oblique here uh, because the degrees are different, right? The degrees are uh, are the same. Okay. Obliques. Okay. So the degrees are the same, so you don't get we don't get slant asymptotes out of that. Okay. Um, you know, remember you only get you only get these if the degree on top was bigger than the bottom. Okay. All right, and so we have and we have our hole. Okay, so let's okay, so let's take a look. So here's the right. So here's our function. Okay. Here's our right. We have y equals three as our vertical asymptote. Okay. Um, our horizontal asymptote was x equals negative two. There is. Uh, so I'll talk about this. In seconds. Okay. 
Uh, there's our uh, pole, okay? And so, because of the way these functions work out, okay, we know that, um, that the function, as x goes to infinity, the function will never cross its horizontal asymptote, okay? So here's your hole, right? So we can draw this, right? So x is gonna get closer and closer to this horizontal asymptote, okay? Same thing here, the, the function, right? As x gets closer and closer to um, negative two, okay, it's gonna get close, right? It's gonna to go to negative infinity, okay? So we know that, and because this is where the hole is, we know the function's gonna do something like this, okay? Now, if you wanna get better accuracy, Okay, then what we can do is we can plot additional points, right? And by the way, so same thing up here, right? As X gets closer and closer to negative two, or as X, sorry, as X approaches negative two from the left side, it's gonna go to positive infinity. And as X goes to negative infinity, it's gonna get closer and closer to Y equals three. Okay? So we know, right, we know the function, because of this, because of this ghost point, right? Because of this hole, we know the function is going to be in this, let's say in this part of this section. But how, how do we know what's going on with the others, right? Uh, what we do is we pick like, we pick another point. In that case, I chose negative three, right? I plug negative three back into the original and that, gave a, and that gives me eight. And so we know that the function must do something like this, okay? Okay, okay. and because we know that the behavior of the function along with the, right, that we know how the function behaves with the horizontal asymptote, we're not going to have anything over here. Right? Because we have, a, and also because we have a vertical asymptote here. And we're not going to have anything in here uh, because the function doesn't go, it doesn't cross over the vertical asymptote. So the test point basically, it, it basically gives us that information, okay? So how do we, right? So we know because the point exists here, then we can definitely say that the um, that the graph is going to go, uh, it's going to be in this part, right, in this section, okay, of the, of the plane, right? So there is, there's where, that's what our function looks like, okay? Okay. So that's about it, all right? So we looked at how to find the domain of the function, okay? Um, how to find the vertical asymptote, how to find the horizontal asymptote, how to find uh, the slant asymptote, and how to, uh, and basically we can use all these ideas to graph a rational function, okay? Um, all right, oh, so by the way, so look, going back to this graph, what will be the domain here? Well, so remember that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative two. So, okay, so it's gonna go from minus infinity to negative two, okay? In fact, we can put this on a line. So negative two is not in a domain. And we also have a hole here, okay? So two and negative two are not in the right in the domain of the function. Okay. All right. So our domain is going to be this. Okay. And I go from minus infinity okay, to negative two, and then from minus two to two, and then from two to infinity. So that is our, right? So that is our domain. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. And just to show you that one more time. So domain goes from, right, from, minus, from minus infinity, okay, up to negative two. Negative two is not in there. 
And then between negative two and two, notice there's a that's where that's where it's there's an open hole. And then from two to infinity. Okay. All right. Okay, so that concludes uh, that concludes this section. Okay. Um, so I'll see y'all next time.